thank you for coming. My name is Marcin Kulka. I'm Polish. I'm from uh, Nineless Data Company, and I'm going to present you our technology automatic predictive modeling uh, on Apache Spark. So uh, I prepared this talk together with Michał Kaczmarczyk, but Michał is absent today as he's working on a project and possibly improving and boosting our technology. So two words about our company, Nine Lives Data. We are an advanced software R&D company based in Warsaw, Poland, with over 75 uh, scientists and software engineers, and we specialize in scalable storage and distributed and big data systems, and we cooperate with partners from US, Japan, and Germany. And this technology I'm going to present is the result of cooperation between Nine Lives Data and NEC, and uh, this technology itself was also presented at Spark Summit uh, 2017 in uh, San Francisco by Masato Asahara and Ryohe Fujimaki. Okay, so now let me share the agenda of today's talk. So this talk is not going uh, to be about uh, huge data. Instead, I will uh, concentrate on many predictive modeling processes uh, we'll start from typical use case for predictive modeling problem, and it will turn out that it is not easy problem, and it will lead us to our technology, automatic predictive modeling. Then we'll concentrate on some design challenges that we face during uh, design and implementation, and then we move to evaluation results. And finally, I will share with you some observations, additional observations. Okay, so let's start from the motivation of our technology. So uh, whole artificial intelligence and also predictive analysis is part of, uh, becomes, uh, and is part of uh, many uh, enterprise applications. And that's why it influence more and more uh, fields of industry and business world, like those presented on uh, the photographs and many more you can imagine. But predictive modeling itself is not easy. It takes a long time and requires high skills. And let's look now at the typical predictive modeling use case. So we have a data, training, validation, and test data. And what we would like to achieve are some re prediction results for our value, and we would like them to be highly accurate. And so we expect our data scientists to provide us good models, predictive models, that will produce highly accurate prediction results. So, and his work, uh, work of our data scientists, actually consists of a few steps. So first is algorithm selection. So our data scientists must choose uh, the best model type so he can choose some simple model type like linear model or uh, decision tree model or something more complicated. He can also take very popular today deep learning model. But here we must remember that uh, actually many real business use cases require that we understand why we predict uh, that particular value. So this is, here is the balance between the accuracy and transparency. Okay, and the second point is uh, hyperparameters tuning. Uh, so we, we would like to tune the parameters of our algorithm. And the last point is feature selection. So we must, uh, data scientists must determine a set of features that is highly correlated with the value we would like to predict. And this whole process uh, is actually, these all steps, the whole process is actually a big effort, uh, many models could be produced during this process, and th th this, these points, these steps are taken in many iterations. Uh, we improve our algorithms, and it may take weeks, and it's quite hard as it requires sophisticated knowledge. So what we actually provide is the automation of this, uh, this whole process. And at the, at the end, we provide highly accurate results, and the, the whole process takes quite short time. OK, so now let's uh, dive more deeply into our technology. 
So we explore massive modeling possibilities uh, in, in our application to start from data preprocessing strategies like missing value imputation, standardization, uh, or random sampling. Then we also go through uh, many uh, possible model types like linear models, decision tree models, or uh, invented by NSC heterogeneous mixture learning models, and also uh, ensemble models of all of these types. Uh, and currently we concentrate on white box models, but of course this is not the limitation, so we can put here all types of models. And in this step, is also performed a uh, machine learning uh, algorithm that provides us feature selection. And the last space we ac actually explore is the space of hyperparameters we would like to tune. So parameters like uh, initial depth uh, of, uh, of the tree or some regularization parameters for uh, feature selection algorithms and many more. And as a result of uh, the, the intersection of all of these dimensions, all these spaces, we can get many models, thousands of models, and it would be really hard to compute uh, all of these uh, on a single server. So that's the, the point where Spark comes and helps us with, by distributing our computation across many machines and accelerating our computation uh, so that we can complete the whole process in hours. So uh, now uh, let's look at the uh, uh, two different flows of our application, modeling flow and a prediction flow. So modeling flow, which actually consists of training and validation and a prediction flow. And what uh, we actually uh, have seen on a previous slide was a uh, uh, different view of a, a training flow. So now let's, let's look at both modeling and, and prediction. So we start from... Uh, providing data, so our user is required to give us the data, training and validation data, together with validation criteria. And then, uh, basing on this data, we produce uh, models. And uh, basing on validation data and validation criteria, we validate those models, uh, and we get validation scores and then uh, validation results and then validation scores so, so that we can choose the best models or we can sort the, the, the models from the best to the worst. And then we can take this best model or a set of best models uh, for the next prediction flow and we can predict some value. And of course, these two flows are fully automated. Okay, so now let's uh, look at the challenges uh, that uh, we actually face during our design and implementation. And these are mostly uh, the challenges uh, that help us to achieve high execution performance. So let's start from the first, uh, first one, uh, using native uh, machine learning engines in Spark. So actually, first we should ask the question why we would like to uh, combine a Spark with uh, native machine learning engines, as they have actually completely different natures. So to answer this question, let's compare Spark and native machine learning engines. So, uh, the f and, and actually when we compare, we would like to compare native machine learning engines with Spark together with some distributed machine learning library, like let's say Spark ML, but possibly so, so, some other also. So, uh, Let's start from the first feature we would like to compare, scalability. So, of course, we, uh, Spark gives us very good scalability, uh, but uh, on, and on the other hand, native machine learning engines provide very limited or actually no scalability. So, in most cases, there is scalability on a single server only. And the second uh, feature that we like to compare is a choice of algorithms that also gives us possibly uh, the, the more algorithms we can take, the, the higher uh, accuracy we, we can get as we can take the, the, the best algorithm, the, the best model. So, and in, for, for this feature, actually, we have uh, some choice for Spark together with some distributed machine learning libraries. 
and as not everything is implemented in a distributed way, sometimes it's difficult to implement in a distributed fashion. And on the other hand, we have many native machine learning uh, algorithms, uh, possibly some historical implementations also, or some custom implementations. Uh, some of them are really very efficient. Uh, and it leads us to the last feature we would like to compare, performance. So of course we can compare performance only if uh, data fits a single server. And uh, performance in case of uh, Spark together with some distributed machine learning engine is I would say uh, medium as there is some overhead on synchronization and the distributed nature that can give us extremely high uh, performance, which we can get from the native machine learning engines. So, and wh what we would like to, uh, to, 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 what we must know at this point is that uh, actually performance is what we uh, need possibly most as we have uh, many uh, thousands of models to compute. So we would like to, to have especially this feature. So. Actually, we would like to have uh, s some of the features from uh, Spark uh, together with some distributed implementation and uh, some from the native machine learning engines. And this is the answer why we would like to combi combine this, these two, so Spark and native machine learning engines. And now I'm going to show you how we actually combine Spark and machine learning engines, native machine learning engines, and we will start from the training flow. So let's look at the training flow from the data perspective. So we start from uh, reading data in a parquet format into a data frame, and we spread those data uh, across many servers. Then we perform some uh, data preprocessing uh, using MapReduce paradigm, so we perform uh, missing value imputation or standardization. And then we would like to move to the uh, second phase of, of uh, our uh, flow, so machine learning. Uh, and this machine learning uh, we intend to do uh, in a way in parallel actually. We would like to execute many native machine learning uh, engines in parallel. It will be done in Spark map operation. Uh, but. Uh, and for the simplicity of this talk, we may assume that a single machine learning uh, engine will be executed on a single executor. Uh, but what we would have to do to move from the uh, first uh, phase, data processing, to the second phase, machine learning phase, so we must uh, so satisfy some uh, input requirements of this second phase. Actually, the input requirements of the machine learning engines that are executed in parallel. So these requirements are the size of data that we provide uh, to them and the format of uh, those data. Uh, so, uh, okay, so what, what we do, so first we downscale uh, our in input initial data uh, by random sampling uh, just to, to get uh, smaller data sets. And uh, the second thing we, we do is converting data in the initial format into the format that is readable and acceptable by this native machine learning engine. So we convert it into uh, some matrix. So as a result, actually we get a RDD of uh, matrices, dense matrices. And these matrices are then uh, uh, read and processed by machine learning engines in parallel. Okay, and uh, so here I would like to, to notice that we use here RDD of huge and very efficiently stored objects optimized for machine learning computations. And, uh, but I will uh, talk a bit more about this uh, later. Okay, and at the end we, we write down the results to the HDFS. And now let's look at the second flow of, uh, of our application, validation flow. So uh, uh, it uh, starts in a similar way. We read uh, data, perform very similar data preprocessing. 
Uh, but then uh, there is a difference to what was in a training phase. So actually we don't perform any downscaling here. We just convert initial f data in, a, in the initial format uh, into the uh, RDD of uh, matrices. And then in the next step, we would like to, uh, in the map operation, perform a prediction. So actually uh, mm, we would like to get a prediction results for, uh, for each uh, model, for uh, each matrix actually, so that the prediction results for a single model are spread across many, uh, many servers, many executors, because uh, across many matrices. And then uh, in a later step, we would like to rearrange our uh, prediction results so that we have uh, prediction results for a, a single model, all prediction results for a single model on a, a single executor uh, because we would like to compute prediction uh, scores for, for, for each model. Okay, and after we produce uh, prediction scores for each model, we can uh, select the best model and that's the end of the validation. Uh, flow and the last flow is a prediction flow. It is very similar to validation flow and uh, the only difference is that uh, in this uh, predict uh, phase we uh, don't perform uh, computation for all the models we have but only for the, the best selected in the validation phase and of course we don't perform uh, selection uh, of uh, best models here as this is only prediction. Okay, and now let's move to the second design challenge, parameter-aware scheduling. So as you remember, in our application, we uh, consider many, uh, many data sets, many matrices, and uh, we uh, also actually uh, consider many possible uh, parameter sets, uh, and we actually combine data sets with many possible uh, parameter sets uh, so that in a machine learning phase we actually process uh, kind of pairs, matrix and parameter set. And parameter uh, set uh, consists of data preprocessing strategies, uh, algorithm types and some hyperparameters. So it was presented a few slides before. Uh, Okay, and this is very important how uh, actually uh, we schedule uh, these, these pairs of data and parameter sets. Uh, so uh, let's first imagine a very naive scheduling. So uh, I would call it parameter centering scheduling where on a single executor we uh, take uh, some parameter set and perform computation for uh, this parameter set and many possible uh, data sets, many possible matrices. So it, this approach uh, uh, makes that we waste a lot of memory. We must load data uh, from other servers very frequently and uh, what is more, we must perform data conversion from the some initial format to the matrix format also very frequently. And on the other hand, uh, and, and w yes, w what we have to also remember is that we don't, of course, we will not implement this naive scheduling in our application, but we may uh, meet uh, this kind of situation if we have uh, the, let's say, random scheduling. So uh, as a solution, we can propose a parameter-aware scheduling uh, in this situation, rather data-centric, where we, uh, for each data set, we schedule uh, computations for many parameter sets. And it saves us a lot of uh, memory. We don't have to load data frequently from other servers uh, and perform uh, some initial format to matrix conversion also frequently. Okay, and now design challenge number three, predictive work balancing. So uh, machine learning phase, uh, 
is actually the most work intensive and time consuming part of our whole flow of our application and we must ensure, uh, that's why we must ensure very good uh, balance of work that is parallelized in this, uh, in this phase. And let's again imagine naive approach, naive balancing of work, naive balancing of models to compute in this phase. So let's look at a, uh, one executor that uh, has to compute some complicated models and it takes a lot of time. And on the other hand, the other executor uh, got very uh, simple uh, models to compute, let's say decision tree models, and it finished very quickly and now it idling for, for a long time. So this is of course very inefficient approach and instead we can propose here a predictive uh, balancing and we, we, we use it. So of course uh, to, to apply this approach we must uh, have a knowledge uh, how to estimate uh, the, the the execution time uh, for each model type, but we do have this knowledge. And in this approach, we balance, first we uh, execute complex models first, and the second thing we do is we balance complex and simple models based on the previous estimations. Okay, and now let's move to the evaluation results. So we uh, made the evaluation on a prediction, for a prediction problem, uh, we compared top 10% precision of targeting potential positive samples, uh, and we compared our results with the results of manual predictive modeling done with scikit-learn for some selected algorithms like logistic regression, SVM, random forests, with uh, some selected preprocessing strategies applied where almost all parameters were set with default values. And we uh, did this evaluation on uh, competition data, KDD Cup 2014, 2015, and IJCAI 2015. And we used for that uh, NEC server DX2000 with almost 300 cores and two terabytes of RAM. And uh, these are the results, so they, are uh, competitive with uh, some other tools. Actually, they are better uh, than logistic regression or SVM and competitive with random forests. Uh, but what is uh, very important uh, for us is very short execution time. And we have to remember in this point, at this point that uh, we have full automation of the whole process. So we don't have to perform uh, any preprocessing, uh, we don't uh, have to tune the parameters, everything is automated, and we also can handle data of, of any size. This is the additional advantage. Okay, so now let me share some additional observations from our work. So first is using RAD of huge but compact objects optimized for ML computations. So this is actually something that I mentioned before. So uh, remember that we have uh, uh, actually during our training flow, we have to move from the, this uh, data preprocessing phase into the machine learning phase. And during that, we convert our initial data into the RDD of dense matrices. And we use those dense matrices to then be processed by machine learning. Uh, engines in the machine learning phase. And actually, why uh, do we use uh, RDD of dense matrices? So uh, in this approach, Spark is used for parallelization and uh, all the necessary data for a single execution are kept without memory overhead because we use dense matrix. This is a very compact object. And, but what is the most important for us is that uh, performance critical operations are executed first on objects that are optimized for that, that have linear algebra operations optimized, dense matrices, and second, that these uh, performance critical operations are executed by very fast native machine learning engines, uh, algorithms, yes. 
Okay, and now let's look at a, our second observation. So limiting execution time overhead in tests on YARN. Okay, so during our uh, testing, our evaluation, we actually uh, had to execute many tests, many uh, integration tests, many tests on YARN. And uh, our observation was that actually submitting application and in a test took, in many cases, similar time to the test itself. So we wasted a lot of, uh, a lot of time, a lot of uh, resources. So uh, that's why we created something like, I would say, simple testing framework so that we uh, submit our application uh, only once and then we, uh, we execute a few tests uh, using the same Spark context uh, and then we finish and we save here a lot of execution time when the number of tests is really huge. Okay, and now the, 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 second obs the third observation, stable execution on YARN. So during our uh, test and evaluation, we actually saw that our application fails uh, from time to time with not enough memory. And even if we uh, served uh, more, more memory to, to Spark to our application, it was still failing. And uh, it turned out to be known problem in Spark. And the problem is that JVM system memory actually sometimes spikes over the limitation, YARN limitation, and YARN must uh, terminate our application. And it is the problem that was actually in details uh, presented uh, uh, at Spark Summit 2016 in a presentation, Understanding Memory Management in Spark for Fun and Profit. And the reason for that is that we actually use more off-hip memory that we declared, and this workaround maybe is to, uh, to uh, increase this value. So in, ca in our case, 15%. Uh, was enough, uh, so we increased this value to 15%, uh, but uh, it's not a good solution. This must be later targetly investigated, as uh, actually for the majority of our execution time, we waste some memory in, in this approach. Okay, so now let me summarize my today's talk. So uh, I started from uh, the predictive modeling problem and uh, which turned out to be a really hard problem, requ requires sophisticated knowledge and takes a long time and it led us to our technology automatic predictive modeling that combines Spark with native machine learning engines and automates the whole process of predictive modeling and at the end provides highly accurate results and the whole process takes at most hours. And as additional advantage, we can handle data of, of any size. When it comes to uh, some future work, so we plan to extend our model set that we consider uh, by d deep learning models. We also would like to speed up our algorithm by using some GPU. And we would like, of course, to reduce yarn memory overhead that I presented. Okay, so that's all from my side. Thank you.